Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. This is my first ever trip to BDS AGM. I will definitely come again if you'll have me. It has been fantastic already, and it's great to talk. I mostly talk to engineers, and so it's great to talk about people who care about the bug itself. Right? That, that's that's where I come from. I, you know, I used to watch these when I was a kid. They were always my favourite things, and it's great to come to a place where so many other people probably experience that, and not to have to sell you on it. Right? But. First off, I'll kick off by saying thanks not only to you guys for having me, but also to the rest of my lab, which are the NBITS lab group at Imperial College London. And this is my boss, Dr. Y.T. Lin, who runs the whole lab. And the lab is interested in all kinds of things. It does robotics, it does a little bit of neuroscience, and then I'm over here in the behavior wing. But we're also really, really thankful for a lot of what I'm going to talk about is stuff that we did in Taiwan. And that's with Dr. Chen here, who is actually the herpetology curator at Taipei Zoo. But apart from that, he's a brilliant natural historian of the dragonflies of Taiwan. He goes around every day, during his lunch break, during his afternoons, and records every single dragonfly he finds. He's a wonderful local expert to get to work with, and we're really lucky. And this work was funded by the Royal Society and the European Research Council pay my salary, so I'm extra thankful for them. So, that's all right. Um, so what exactly does it look like if you're sat next to a pond in Taiwan? This is just a sort of live view of what it's like. This is all these different species, and you can have 10, 15, 20 different species in the air at the same time, all over one pond. And this is maybe two meters across by four meters long in the center of Taipei. So a big, major city. And you have these constant aerial interactions while the sun is out. And that's quite similar to British pond, maybe got slightly more abundance, maybe slightly more diversity. Than you <laughs> we go here because we can film these interactions, and we can get far more interactions. It's more time efficient for us. But what really interests me is not only what, what are the species that we're seeing, but what are they doing? And what are all of these little interactions that we're seeing? Because any dragonfly that spends any time in the air here is not alone for very long. They're constantly interacting with each other. And we can think of this as boiling down into three different types of chase. And each type of chase corresponds to something that we might call one of the Fs of biology. And so the first F of biology really is feeding. And that's predation. And, of course, the second is fighting. It's very important that you both defend your territory, especially if you're a dragonfly. You've got this pond that you want to stay near, you want to guard, because that's a, that's a locally defensible resource. And you need to have the fuel in order, in order to do it and grow and build that flight muscle. And so that's where they're feeding. And the third F of biology is mating. And that's... <laughs> it's possibly the most important one here. If you're not going to do anything else, you want to do that little one. Uh, especially, and we are talking from the perspective of a male dragonfly in this instance, although obviously it's important to the female as well. And so I'd like to think about some of the differences between these types of interaction and then the shapes that they take over the pond. But not, you know, we've seen so many wonderful dragonflies, and this is Neurothemis taiwanensis, unfortunately we don't find it in Nottingham. It is an endemic species to Taiwan, and I can show you this picture, and I don't need to sell it to this room. Every single one of you should appreciate it. This is a gorgeous animal. But it's also beautiful for other reasons apart from just cool to look at. It is a beautifully tuned engine by evolution to do stuff. And what is that stuff it does? And what are the tunings that it's got? We can see what's specific about dragonflies. And one is that they've got this muscular, really muscular thorax. That thorax is mostly full of muscle. And they've got direct flight control. Each one of those muscles in the thorax is connecting to a wing base or some of the sclerites, some of the bits of articulation at the base of the wing. They're driving the force straight to the wings. But they've also got this long, flexible abdomen. It's quite particular. That's actually quite a light structure, so the center of mass of this animal is actually sitting about there. It's not somewhere down in this abdomen. So it's got a long, light abdomen, and that, we can think about how they end up using that. They've got their wings, two pairs of directly controlled high aspect ratio wings, and that's, that's particular to dragonflies as well. That's, that's quite odd. If we compare it to something like a fly, well, if we look at the wing loading, which is how much mass you have for an area of wing, we can see that it's about 10 times, almost 10 times more for a housefly than it is for a dragonfly. And what does that allow the dragonfly to do? We'll come on and think about that in a second. But they've also got these high aspect ratio wings, about four times as long as they are cordwise or in depth. And then finally, they've got this direct flight muscle connection between where the flight muscle is going and onto the wing. Unlike the fly, flies actually drive all of the force through their thorax. They're compressing their thorax over and over again, and that's driven through a mechanical linkage to the wings. And they kind of run that engine constantly and then tune it and change, maybe change gear, maybe change exactly how they're steering that. But the engine's always running. But in a dragonfly, that engine isn't always running. They're able to do stuff like this, which is a black-tailed skinner, 
doing a climbing inverted dive. Oh, it takes a couple of wing beats at the top, but that's not driven by thrust. That's driven by momentum. And that's what's unusual about dragonflies, is they spend a lot of their time gliding. Some of the larger locusts, there are a few migratory species, but flies almost never glide. I've never seen a video of a fly doing a glide, but dragonflies do, and that's, that's integral to their biology. But what is all of this doing? What's it for? Well, it's really to carry the head around. The head is a finely balanced, extremely mobile structure at the top of the dragonfly, and it comes down to this really thin neck. That's why if you have a held dragonfly in your hand, maybe doing surveys, this kind of thing, you can see quite often that head move around. But you probably won't experience the, the kind of level... Is that me? <laughs> the level of balance that's going on in that head. Because when they're locked down and they're kind of static in, space, uh, in place, they have these head arrested muscles that could clamp that neck down and keep it nice and firm. But as soon as they're in flight, those head arrested muscles relax and allow that head to flop around, but it's not flopping around. It's staying locked to the horizon or maybe locked on a target while they're in flight. And so what's actually on this head, but of course I don't need to tell you that most of the head is either jaw or eyeball. And so most of the dragonfly is about carrying their jaws and eyeballs, and well, I won't have a photo of this, but also their genitalia around. That's what most of the dragonfly is there to do. This eye is not constant the whole way around, if we look at this compound eye. It actually changes as you go across it. The structure is different. On the side, you can see that you've got these closely arranged, relatively small lenses, whereas on the top of those lenses, it's a kind of subtle effect, but those lenses can be two to three times bigger in some species. Now, for optical reasons that I'm not going to dive into now, that allows you either greater sensitivity or greater zoom, greater angular resolution. And that depends on exactly how you tune your optics underneath. That tells us that the top of the eye is different to the side of the eye. And actually what this effectively does is create a high resolution region of vision right in a cone at the top, the kind of field of view of the animal. So it can see really, really accurately, accurately, wrong word, with high resolution here. It's got a pair of binoculars staring at the sky. For the rest of the visual field, it's not worse, it's just tuned differently. But of course they're actually running a completely separate visual system at the same time. They've got three more eyes sitting there. And, and for many insect experts, you'll know all about these. But these are three more eyes, but they're not like the compound eyes. They are camera-type eyes. They're like yours. They've got a single lens and a bank of receptors sitting behind them. Except they're not really a camera you'd want to use because they're completely out of focus. The focal plane is about five times further away back into the animal than where all of the receptors are sitting. And actually, this whole receptor bank goes down onto just a couple of neurons that can't take spatial information very well. It's a lot of work on exactly how much can come out of it. Basically, if you take a picture of this, you wouldn't be able to see a person. What you can do is you can detect where the horizon is, and you can do that really fast, insanely fast. Like compound eyes have a refresh rate of 200 to 300 hertz, so that's already fast. It's much better than any pro gamer, no matter what they're going to tell you. But actually, this is working even faster and telling the dragonfly where the horizon is at any one time. So if a sudden gust of wind hits them, knocks them sideways, they're going to know almost instantaneously. So, most of what I'm going to be showing you is work that I've been doing on this, which is Trithemus aurora, which is an absolutely stunning dragonfly from Taiwan. And these are wonderful for so many different reasons. For me, the reason is they're extremely aggressive. They're not very nice to be around if you're another dragonfly. And uh, I'll come on to talk about what they do with all that aggression. But they don't... Well, most of what they're doing is something like this. They're sitting atop of a perch, catching some rays, and then this, you see that initial headlock, and then it's tracking... That is tracking a small target flying overhead. And many of you will have seen this through binoculars, or uh, maybe if you're lucky, you can get quite close to it. And it's taking off after it. So what is actually happening here is that it's using high-resolution binoculars on top of the head to snap onto the target, track it. And that tracking isn't just the head. The whole body is tracking it to allow that neck, that flexibility to track where that target is. And it's taking, on, taking off after it. What does that pursuit look like after they've taken off? So you're going to see the dragonfly come from down here in red to chase a target going above in blue. And you can see here that our target is nice and linear. It's quite an easy catch for a dragonfly. The dragonfly is mostly coming from underneath, from a standing start, overtakes it, and the poor little thing never knew what hit it, to be honest. You, it's often quoted that they get 95 to 97% success rates. I would say in our videos, of which we don't have that many of the actual predation where we can see the catch, it's more like 40 to 50 percent. That probably varies massively based on species, lighting conditions, all kinds of other aspects going on. But that is still an astronomically high success rate for any, any predator. But we can start thinking about, well, what, what is this interaction? What is the shape? What defines how fast the dragonfly goes and where it steers? It could fly any single line, but it chooses 
for want of a better word, this line to follow in towards the target. So the way that we approach this is sitting by a pond, 35 degrees centigrade, 100% humidity, sweating it out with a pair of very expensive cameras and what looks a bit like a bomb in a bag with wires kind of poking out in every single way. These are two high-speed cameras, and they are synchronized so that we're taking a frame together with each camera at the same time. That allows us two perspectives on any time frame, any single frame of time that happens in front of it. That allows us to calculate depth. And so if we can track the dragonfly, we can measure exact 3D position with a certain amount of error that we can calculate. Then we can calibrate the cameras and really start resolving kinematics. And what are kinematics? It's things like speed, acceleration, and geometry of this interaction. That allows us to really start breaking it down. I'm not going to start on a geometry lesson. I go, come talk to me afterwards if you want to talk geometry. We're going to keep it nice and loose with lots of videos. And so this is a reconstruction of that interaction that you've just seen there. So you can see here the target goes overhead and the dragonfly comes from underneath. And suddenly we can start seeing features about this interaction. So, one, it looks a bit like a right-angled triangle. Ignore the fact it's kind of right-angled, but it is a, it's more or less a triangle. The target can double back, and the dragonfly could absolutely take account of that, although it, they actually do have a less success rate. If the target does make a maneuver, they are less likely to hit it. But the dragonfly sails from underneath from a standing start, and by the end, it's going about three times faster than its target. And what's happening, if you look at these lines of sight, which are lines that connect where the target and the dragonfly are through time, they stay roughly parallel. Well, that means is if they were traveling at the same speed, the dragonfly and the target would always be at the same time point. Because the dragonfly is picking up more and more speed, it can fly faster than this poor little guy here, all that extra speed is being driven upwards towards the target from beneath, where the target has the least resolution of vision as well, before it smacks it out of the air from below. Well, unfortunately, there's something else that we engineer that does exactly the same thing, but it does give me some handy maths to start analyzing this engagement, and I'm afraid it is missiles. We don't do military research, it's not that kind of institute, but we can use our understanding of missiles to start understanding dragonflies. We can go from engineering back into the animal. And you can see here, this is just a little simulation of how uh, modern missiles would go and intercept a target traveling in a circular path. And so we can start using our understanding of this to say, well, have they obeyed the same engineering constraints that we would do if we were making an engineering system to fulfill the same task? But let's think more specifically about the dragonfly again. This is the eye, and you can see again there's that variation if you look at the top. Sorry, excuse me, you can probably all see my pulse. Um, you can see the top of the dragonfly's eyes is red color, and that's where that region of specialized vision, that sort of binoculars against the sky. And the rest of the eye is slightly poor resolution, it's that pinky color. It's got much smaller lenses. Well, we go out into the middle of the pond with a long stick, and we take 360 degree images of the visual scenery at a, a kind of relevant height that these interactions are happening on. And then we can find out where the skyline and it's much easier to see a small target against the sky than it is against the ground. Not only is the sky much, much brighter, and that sounds obvious, but it's, it's really orders of magnitude brighter than the ground, so that gives you much better contrast ratio against this target. It's also more consistent. If you're ever trying to watch something against the ground, well, sometimes it's going to be brighter than the ground, sometimes it's going to be dark, and it's much harder to track that. And so we might think that the dragonflies are using the sky, and they're trying to stay under it, not only because that's where the other fly, the, the fly can't see them, but it's also where they can see it best. And if we collapse this all down to the dragonfly, then in blue you can see the positions of all the targets that we have them recorded capturing, it kind of forms this cone coming out from the dragonfly that they're keeping the target in through their maneuvers as they head in. This is a sort of, it's kind of a little esoteric to understand, but if you're in the center here, that's where the dragonfly is going and it's directly at the horizon. <laughs> the top here is directly above the dragonfly and to either side of this plot, is the side on the right or the side on the left. And this concentration of where the target is tells you again that it's keeping it in this region, mostly above the skyline. But of course, dragonflies aren't only chasing prey. And so hopefully this one will take off in a second. Never remember if I need to press something. Oh, yeah, there it is. And so we'll just watch him sail off. Sometimes they take you off, but not after prey. And they'll set on what looks like a patrol. And so you'll see these sometimes flapping, sometimes gliding patrol as they edge their way around the pond. Of course, what is he patrolling for? These guys are perchers, they never hunt. Well, we don't observe them hunting. 
uh, whilst airborne. No, he's looking for other males. And to be honest, anything red, he doesn't really care if it's another male of his right species. He will attack pretty much anything that you put out there that's the right colour. And they'll begin an aerial interaction against each other. Sometimes they find each other on the wing, sometimes they go and knock each other off perches. You can see here a male going into, he's having none of that. And they'll begin to enter into a chase. And so really, when we set out, the question is, does this obey the same rules as all this predation work? And there's quite a lot of, there's quite a lot of body of work on that predation and, and, and the visual properties. But if you think about how is this different than what you've just seen to the predation? What, what's different about it? Well, if you are a little fruit fly, you're not going to have a good day no matter what. Because you've suddenly got this dragonfly sitting underneath you and it's coming up towards you. That's pretty much like if you're flying a Cessna and you've got an F-22 Raptor on your tail. The best thing you can probably do to not get caught is to crash. Like, to just get down and get below. And that's probably the, the best possible evasion strategy. That's certainly what mayflies seem to do in certain circumstances. If you want to talk about mayflies, you can do that all day. Um, but things are a little bit different if you're another dragonfly. That's a bit like if you find yourself also happening to fly an F-22 Raptor at the same time. That's suddenly what we call a symmetric engagement. Because you have a more even ability to counteract or to counter-maneuver against your target as it does to catch you. And so that's a really important difference. There's not much a fruit fly can do. It can turn tight corners and hope that at the last minute it happens to turn the right corner that causes the dragonfly to miss. Or the dragonfly might just circle around and go do it again, in which case, good luck. Um, but what, how, how do other dragonflies react? So you're going to see exactly that interaction filmed here at 250 frames per second. You can see that this red and blue interaction looks nothing like the predation flights that we were seeing there. Uh, and you can see this, this 3D structure that you get out the end. And so we were starting to analyze this, started to pick this apart, and starting to look at the visual aspects of this. Where, where is the target in your field of view, and how do you react to it being there? Well, if we do that collapsing again, we collapse all down to the, one of the dragonflies, we can see that the other dragonflies generally can be either in front or behind. And actually, if you look side on to the dragonfly, they're in this cloud ahead and above, or they're in this cloud behind and below. Why do you get this symmetric cloud? Well, sometimes the dragonfly is chasing you, or the other dragonfly is chasing you, sometimes you're chasing it. And so that's why that's symmetric. This cloud is where you're doing the chasing. This cloud, lower down, is where you're being chased. And so we can see that maps out on the same visual field here. But rather than being clustered right above the skyline, we're sitting below the skyline. And we can emph it's sort of in this cluster here is where the, the other dragonfly would be. And so we might assume that that's in some way a sort of thing that the dragonfly is trying to control for. It's trying to keep the other male in this visual region. And that's what it might be trying to optimize towards. Because ultimately, we don't really know what the dragonfly wants out of this engagement. So here, this is just clarifying that your Drosophila, your fruit fly, your prey target is always sitting pretty much in where the sky is visible. But your conspecific, the other dragonfly, is almost always being viewed against shrubbery backwards, background trees. And so it's not relying on this really high resolution bit of vision at the top, like this blue cone that's projecting out of my very crude dragonfly here. Instead, it's occupying a completely different visual cone. So this means that we think they're using different bits of the eye for different bits of interaction. Because if you try to use the same bit of your eye for this blue cone as you did for this red cone, where the other dragonfly is going to be, you'd have to tilt your whole body sort of like that. The neck only has so much it can go down. And flying a plane like this is not a good idea. So that really suggests that, that it's happening all over the eye, which then changes how they might be processing that information, suggests that the actual control of that could be different. But this is the circumstance that we find for this species. And bear in mind, this probably varies massively between different species. We have the dragonfly in some sort of chasing position, and the dragonfly in an evading position. Um, and th these, there's kind of about 35 degrees of elevation from this chaser to the evader. And this might be something they're trying to control for. So do the interactions actually look like this? Well, yes, you get phases where they're shooting across. And it's called, in dogfighting lingo, it's called an extension. So you shoot over to the other side, and, and you're staying just on, on you know, the bogey's tail. But actually, real interactions are a lot more complicated. That might be something you're trying to move towards in some sort of platonic ideal of where you'd like to keep the other male. But instead, you get all kinds of variety because, of course, your target is maneuvering. So earlier, I was talking about what we call this parallel navigation, where they're constantly using their speed to either keep pace with the target or to close range with the target. So do we find that here? 
Well, no. In all of these interactions that you can see here, these are 3D reconstructions of real interactions, red has much more speed than blue, and it's well within its maneuverability envelope, which is something I'll come on to talk about later, and yet it doesn't close that. It doesn't just go up and smack straight into the side of the other dragonfly. Why do you not want to do that? Well, you've got this beautiful, delicate mech. And if you push it headfirst into another dragonfly at high speed, you're going to come to much more injury. And so that starts to beg the question of exactly what the purpose of these interactions are. It's not necessarily that you want to go and hit the other dragonfly as fast as possible. And I think that should be self-evident to anyone who's spent enough time watching them. That some of this might be to do with showmanship, some of it may be threat displays. And also, if you're viewing a target against the sky above you, you can't see its colour. But if you're below your target and you're kind of patterning around him and you're sick, sitting just below him in your, his field of view, he can see all your colours, your displays, he can see everything about you. And so really it's looking like these are completely different types of interactions. But what is the competition here when you have an interaction like this one? Well, something really important just happened just there. And I'll let it play again so that we can just measure it. So you've got these two that are kind of what's called a flat scissors. This one dives, and something happened just there. And that's a really repeated feature of something that does not happen in predation. Your fruit fly never chases your dragonfly. At least, if you've observed that, please write to me. Um, I would love to hear from you. But as far as I'm aware, your hare rarely chases your fox. Here, we have blue that is initially doing an evasion, turning into the chaser. This is a counter maneuver. This is how you turn the tables of this interaction. If you've suddenly got this guy sitting on your tail and you don't know how to get rid of him, well, there are maneuvers that allow you to get behind your target. Actually, you'll see a common thread in all of these. It's a banked dive followed by a sharp turn to sit down and underneath him. Sorry, I don't really have the right words up here to describe it, but hopefully you can see this kind of common feature. I'll let one more play. So he's going to go dive and sit behind it. But why? Why is this a good thing to do if you want to turn the tables on his engagement and become the chaser, which we assume they want to be? Well, let's just go through it again. So we have the evasion start. We have this kind of bank where they, they roll the body and then they kind of do it partly pitching manoeuvre to bring themselves into a steep vertical dive. And then they sit in this chase position directly underneath the target. Well, we can think again about what this does in visual space. So here, you're going to see some plots that go from red to blue in time. So, so dots are changing colour as time progresses from the perspective of the evader and from the perspective of the chaser. So in the evader view, while it's doing this, the other dragonfly is staying in a visual region, either to the left or to the right, and it's traveling, but it's staying on one side. And that's exactly what happens. If you spiral around an object, it's going to stay exactly where it is, uh, sorry, stay exactly where in your visual field it was at the start of the interaction. But from the chaser's perspective, what's happened is you're lovely, you're controlling this engagement. You've got your target sitting exactly where you want him, just above the horizon. You're sitting just below him, and all of a sudden he disappears behind you at 3,000 degrees per second. And not only, he's not traveling overhead, he's always traveling below you, where the contrast is worse, where he's more hidden against the undergrowth. And yet, this is several thousand degrees per second. And that matters, that's that angular speed as they shoot past. And so you'll see the sort of pattern of motion here. That for this guy, okay, there's a little bit of travel, but the evader is mostly keeping the other dragonfly on his right or his left. Whereas here, we're seeing it go from this optimum position right past it and much at a really fast angular rate. And angular rates, when they get really high, it's much harder for people to track them, uh, for dragonflies to track them. Sorry, get the two mixed up. Um, but what happens when this doesn't work? What happens if your blue starts his dive, but red cottons on because it's not quite the right space because he's able to visually track it? Well, here you can see a different kind of interaction. Blue dives, the red follows. But here, blue still gets him. Go on. And so you can see 3D reconstructions of these types of interactions. And what we think is happening is that the maneuver is brought about on where in the field of view you see your target as being. And actually, the target, in both of these cases, when it starts its dive, it happens to already, from the chaser's perspective, be in a position that will create the dive. And so they're both diving against each other in a competition, maybe of chicken, maybe they worry about ground clearance, maybe they lose track of the other dragonfly. We don't exactly know what causes the winner of this interaction. But it seems like this repeated maneuver of just dive to get out of the way. And that's actually something we teach to fighter pilots. This is a defensive spiral. This is taken from the air combat maneuvering uh, handbook. Now this, you know, I don't want you to think that dragonflies sit and learn maneuvers. That may not be the case. These are evolved processes and they're probably the products 
of continuous control systems is much more variable. It's not just some like playbook thing that you do. It's still interesting that you get similar optimalities and similar shapes of interaction coming from something that's traveling at Mach 3 versus something that's just traveling at a few meters per second, albeit that's pretty fast if you're that small. Yeah, and so we'll, we'll again think about what actually is the contest that's going on here. What, what, what limits what a dragonfly can do in the air? What, is, what are the flight limits? And we think of this as something called a, like a maneuverability envelope or a speed envelope for uh, a flying craft. So if you take a classic fighter plane, like an F4 Phantom like this, you have your airspeed along the x-axis. So if you go from left to right, you're going higher speed. And this is your turn rate in an angle per second. So the higher you are on this y-axis, the faster you're turning. Now, there's this g limit, and that means the faster you go for an equivalent turn rate, you're pulling more and more g. And at a certain point, if you go above this g limit, that means that either your plane's going to fall to bits or your pilot will. And whichever one of those happens first depends on what aircraft you're flying or your pilot. Uh, but actually, below a certain maximum, maximum turning rate, you actually get again, a reduction. That's because you need all that air rushing over the wings to generate the flight force. Well, before you eventually stall, you can't, there's a limit to how slow you can fly in a fixed-wing aircraft that just has these, this thrust coming out the back of it. Well, do we get the same shape in dragonflies? Well, we can fit the same sort of data, but instead, we don't get that cutoff that you see here. You see how this goes down and they have a stall speed. Dragonflies don't stall. So why doesn't a dragonfly stall? Because it's not a plane, <laughs> right? Down here, it's operating in a pretty similar to, uh, pretty, pretty much like a plane. But as soon as you get here, it's starting to become a helicopter because, of course, they're directing thrust. They're flapping. And you show this to a bunch of aerodynamic engineers, and they start salivating. Because look at this maneuverability envelope. Wow, look at that. Great. Um, to me, I just think it's absolutely remarkable that you've got this kind of change in behavior between a dragonfly that can hover pretty much in place and a dragonfly that can pull 4G turns at 7 meters per second. That's remarkable ability. So how do we actually probe this question of maneuverability and what a dragonfly can do at further levels? Well, that's where I come on to moths around lights. And how is this relevant? How can, what can moths around lights start teaching us about maneuverability? Well, what I did for a separate project that I've been working on is add little motion capture markers to the back of the animals. You can see there's three retroreflective markers. And I should point out, obviously, this moth probably doesn't enjoy having scales removed, but all these animals can be released afterwards, after the captive flight experience. But these markers, if we can see them in space, not only tell us the position, but also the orientation of the insect while it's in flight. Whereas the other data I was talking about, mostly we're just treating them as two little blobs that are interacting. This is, this is a higher level of information. So then we have a motion capture system. And you might be familiar with this from games, films, TV, where you have somebody covered in ping pong balls. Well, what I've done is covered an animal in ping pong balls and got it to fly around in a flight arena. These cameras then flash infrared ring lights, and they're, they're, those markers bounce the light back along the axis. So sort of like a, a roadway sign that you might see, or maybe a cyclist reflector, bouncing that light back towards you for a relatively limited amount of light thrown out. And that means that we can spot these markers with really high accuracy when we have eight cameras all looking at the same time we get down to about a quarter of a millimeter in terms of uh, sorry, positional accuracy. So that's a real insect scale. That, that means even if the markers are quite close together, we can still tell what orientation they are. And why moths? Well, it turns out the dragonflies do the same thing as moths. You fly a dragonfly around a blacklight, which is what you've got going on here. You get a dragonfly traveling at four meters per second in a tight circle. And the tightness of that circle is related to its ability to maneuver. So we can probe this question of how much dragonflies can maneuver by how fast and how tightly they can turn corners around this light here. And you'll see this in high speed here. This is filmed at 1,000 frames per second. Why are they rolling over? You can read all about that in our preprint that came out earlier this year, which was from a separate project, but it still allows us this window into what are the constraints and limits on the flight. And if we pull out some of that data again, forgive me, these are the last graphs in it, but we have the amount of lateral acceleration. Well, what is lateral acceleration? That's basically g-force, but sideways, for how rolled over the animal is. And so we can start building a model for as the dragonfly starts to roll, this is how much g-force they're going to experience as they turn that curve. Meanwhile, we can see that as their speed increases, their turn radius also increases. And that's another limit that's probably being built into the chase system, because you have to 
basically bear in mind what your g limit is. What does turn radius mean here? What is, what is this relationship? Turn radius is how tight your curve is. If it's very, very low, you've got a very small turn radius. So you're doing this. You go further up this y-axis, and you're turning much larger curves. Obviously, if you're a dragonfly, you want to be kind of as close to here as possible. You want to be able to go at 4 meters per second and turn on the spot. Unfortunately, your wings would fall off. That's not physically uh, possible. We actually don't know what causes this G-limit. What I'd love to do is take a variety of different dragonflies suited to different habitats and start probing, well, how is their airframe tuned differently to fit their lifestyle? And that's something that I'm thinking about more long term. So what have I said so far? Well, I've said things like missiles represent asymmetric engagements. And that's a lot of, a lot of work. That's classic stuff to do with like hair, fox in the hair and all this kind of maths. Dogfights, it's actually very limited maths, and it's a much more complex interaction. We might need to think about it differently. You have equivalent speed, equivalent turn rate, and you have this unique ability to turn around. But, of course, I'm only talking about male-male interactions. I'm afraid it is very typical for me to spend all this time talking about men. What, 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 are, the, what are the female dragonflies doing? Something completely different. And unfortunately, we haven't really got it, like, dived into exactly what's going on, mostly focusing on male-male interactions for now. But each one of these videos is centered on a female dragonfly, and you'll see the same maneuver happening over and over again. That is pretty close to an Immelmann turn, if anyone flies a plane. That is a pitch and then a roll, except they're kind of doing them at the same time in a way that a pilot would have an aneurysm if you tried. Um, so the females are doing that, but they're doing it vertically going up. Male dragonflies never do that. And so why the females evade males in this way, but males always dive, we don't know. We don't have a good idea. We're still working up to that. Possibly this allows her to turn which way her velocity is pointing very, very fast because she's already traveling slower. She's making, a, a sort of, she's making use of that maneuverability problem of speed versus turn rate. But yeah, just things that we're starting to look, in, uh, look into. And then finally, just to really emphasize quite how maneuverable these animals are, occasionally they do this. Whee! <laughs> And I saw this. I dropped my mouse, and I was like, okay, what's that? Now, this, ha this is uh, recorded at 250 frames per second. I know that people who spend a lot of time in the field, they're aware this happens, but it's quite hard to see with your naked eye. But what is this? Well, it tends to happen after dragonflies have just done this. And so what it looks like to me, we don't have the data to say for sure, looks to me like your dog once it's just got out the river shaking all the water off. That, that would be a very way of creating a centrifugal force that shakes all your water and throws it off. And obviously water hanging on you would make you heavier and therefore less maneuverable. Why exactly they're diving into the water is a whole other set of questions, because most of these are actually, uh, some of them are females, some of them are males. Both will dive into the water and bounce back out. Could be to do with thermoregulation. There's lots of different theories uh, playing around. So to come back, some, in summary, dogfights are really unlike predation, and that's, that's a really important thing I want you to take away. And if anyone is just sat now watching dragonflies over the pond next summer, Please bear this in mind, and if you have any bright ideas, just message me. I, I'm, I'm always fascinated. I love this stuff. Dragonflies show repeated motifs, and they switch roles. So not only are they swapping roles, but it doesn't look like it's purely creativity. It looks like there are certain advantages, ways to maneuver against your target. And then finally, dragonflies have to trade off speed against turn rate, much like any vehicle, any of us. We do it, you know, when you're driving a car, when you're steering a bike, or any of these things. But they do it under unique constraint conditions unique constraints and unique conditions that are specific to them. And it'd be lovely to start comparing that between dragonflies and then dragonflies against other species. And so finally, I will thank you for your... Oh, no, I won't. Let's try that again. There we go. I'll leave you with some videos that we were taking in Taiwan of other species. We've only been talking about basically one species so far. This is Neurothemus taking off. I'll sort of point some things out. And I'll be happy to take any comments, questions, criticisms. Oh, sorry, watch this. Four wings held out, hind wings moving. That's a display. So this Neurothemus is showing off. That's not his female. That's a completely different species. He's got no idea. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'll let this run in the background, but if anyone has any comments or questions to start with. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Do come from the later.